Let's continue to talk about substitution of the carbonyl oxygen in the case of aldehydes and of ketones. In this webcast, we'll replace that oxygen with another oxygen. However, the carbon-oxygen double bond will be replaced with a pair of carbon-oxygen single bonds. So if we're talking about aldehydes, where one of the substituents attached to the carbonyl carbon is H, then we end up generating what's known as an acetal functional group. There you can see the original H. The carbon that was the carbonyl carbon has transformed into an sp3 carbon, and you can see that it has bound to that carbon two carbon-oxygen single bonds. Now, in the case of ketones, it's analogous, except we have no hydrogen attached to that carbon. We still can see the two carbon-oxygen single bonds. This functional group is known as the ketal. Where does this come from? Well, these two carbon-oxygen single bonds come from two equivalents of an alcohol. You can see them there in the case of the aldehyde and the ketone functional group. And in both cases, the byproduct is water. In the first step, this involves an addition of the elements of alkoxide, OR, and hydrogen across what was the carbon-oxygen double bond. So there you can see the carbon-oxygen double bond, and you can see that we've done an addition reaction. We've added alkoxide to the carbonyl carbon, and we've added H to that carbonyl oxygen. This functional group, in the case of aldehydes, is known as a hemiacetal, and in the case of ketones, a hemiketal. This is where the carbonyl carbon has a hydroxyl group and an alkoxide group. This is intermediate along the way to the acetal and ketal functional group. What happens next, and it will become clear when we talk about the mechanism, is an elimination reaction to make a double bond, and then an addition reaction of this second alkoxide group. That's where the byproduct water is lost, and that generates the acetal and ketal functional group. Let's look at some real bonds and atoms, an example of each of these. Starting with the acetal, we can recognize this as an acetal because there's a carbon that's connected to a pair of carbon-oxygen single bonds. That carbon is also connected to a hydrogen, so we know that it came from an aldehyde. Those alkoxide segments, in this case methoxide segments, were derived from two methanol molecules, and we can see that there's a loss of water. In the second case, rather than having two equivalents of an alcohol, we have a single molecule that carries with it two hydroxyl substituents. This is known as a diol. The product that's obtained is a five-membered ring, Four of the atoms of that five-membered ring are going to come from the diol, so atoms two, three, four, and five. And then atom number one is the atom that was the carbonyl carbon. Typical of acetal and ketal formation, both of these reactions are reversible, and they can be driven to the right by Le Chatelier's principle. If we remove water from the reaction, we can drive these equilibrium to the right. How do we remove water? There's a clever apparatus. It's called a Dean-Stark apparatus, and it allows us to shift equilibria by removing water. The aldehyde or ketone, together with the alcohol, are placed down at the bottom, along with a solvent like benzene. Benzene is especially useful because its vapor, which travels up this arm, is rich in water. But while the vapor phase is rich in water, the liquid phase, which condenses in the reflux condenser, is an immiscible pair of liquids that contains, on the top phase, a benzene-rich layer, which returns back to the pot as it overflows, and then the heavier phase, which is a water-rich phase, which the chemist can drain from the stopcock at the bottom to remove water from the reaction medium. Now let's take a look at the mechanism of these reactions. The overall stoichiometry of the mechanism that we're going to write is shown at the top. We'll take this ketone, its acetone, combine it with two equivalents of methanol to make the ketal that's shown here along with water as the byproduct. Please make a note that these reactions are conducted in the presence of an acid catalyst, and the purpose of the acid catalyst is to enhance the electrophilicity of the carbonyl group. So to begin, we're going to do that right away, do a proton transfer to the carbonyl oxygen to make this pi bond a better electrophile. 
that sets up a nucleophile addition to a polarized pi bond. This AD sub N step generates the tetrahedral intermediate shown here with now the positive charge on the oxygen that came from methanol. We've seen these kinds of steps before. We've written the proton transfer as an intramolecular proton transfer to make this hydroxyl group a good leaving group that we need to get rid of. But in this case, we're going to actually do it stepwise rather than an intramolecular proton transfer. And the main reason I, I show that is to just show that the hemiketal, I'll abbreviate it HK, this structure here, is an intermediate on the pathway between the molecule of acetone and methanol and the final ket ketal that we're going to generate. The hemiketals and the hemiacetals are generally not isoluble species. We can't put them in a bottle. The equilibrium will go one direction or the other in general. There are a few important exceptions, but by and large, these are not isoluble species. So what happens next? We need to get rid of that hydroxyl group, and we can do that by converting it into a good leaving group. We'll protonate it to make what will become water. When we do the next beta elimination, that produces water as the byproduct, and this good electrophile in what looks like a carbonyl oxygen that's protonated, but now it has a methyl group rather than a proton bound to it. So this elimination has set up a good electrophile for that second equivalent of methanol to come in. A nucleophile addition to a polarized pi bond creates another tetrahedral intermediate, which is just a proton transfer step away from producing the ketal. So in this webcast, you've seen that we can transform carbonyl groups by substitution at oxygen, replacing the carbon-oxygen double bond with a pair of carbon-oxygen single bonds to make ketals, acetals, hemiketals, and hemiacetals.